Hey, it's Michelle, your CSC Biology Tutor. In this video, I'll be looking at the Human and Social Biology Specimen Paper 1. So this is a paper that consists of the multiple choice questions. So here is what the paper looks like. The duration of the paper is 1 hour and 15 minutes, and it consists of 60 items, so 60 questions to answer in that 1 hour and 15 minutes. Okay, let's begin. So question one, which part of the cell controls all activities that take place within it? So this for sure would be the nucleus, which consists of the genetic material, so such as DNA, which would be enclosed in chromosomes. So the nucleus controls all the activities of the cell. Question two, which of the following specialized cells is found in the gut? So the gut is pretty much the digestive system, so it's part of the digestive system. So let's see what we have here. So the first one looks like a, a phagocyte. B looks, I'm uncertain what this is, a collection of cells arranging themselves in these, these long elongated forms. Um, probably some kind of connective tissue. We know for sure C, that would be a neuron. So it looks like a motor neuron there. And D is showing you a section of epithelial cells. So these are epithelial cells. And you can see that on the top, you're seeing some microvilli. So this definitely would be the type of cells that you would find lining the small intestines, which would be part of the digestive system. So therefore, the correct answer would be D. So those are epithelial cells or epithelial tissue. So they line the small intestine and help to increase um, the absorption of nutrients into the blood. All right, let's go to question three. So item three refers to the following food web, which shows the feeding relationships for animals in a forest. So we have our food web outlined there in the diagram. So it says, which of the following outcomes will occur if the mealybug becomes extinct? So if by chance the mealybug is no longer present in the ecosystem, so we get rid of him, what would be a possible consequence? So let's see what we have here. So it says the hibiscus leaves will decrease. So that definitely would not happen. Actually, the opposite would occur. So that rules out um, option A. Because with the mealybug being at stink, the, only the caterpillar will be feeding off of the hibiscus leaves. So therefore, you would expect the hibiscus leaves to increase rather than decrease. Um, let's look at option B. The anteater population will die out. So the anteater, so that is the top consumer. So the anteater feeds on ladybirds. It feeds on caterpillars. It feeds on termites. So the mealybug being extinct is not going to affect the anteater so much because it has other food options. So although, yes, it feeds on the mealybug normally, but it can still rely on the ladybird, the caterpillar, and the termite. So that is not going to happen. The anteaters are not going to die out because the mealybug goes extinct. Option C says the ladybird population will die out. So the ladybird is the, the organism that is dependent on the mealybug. It has no other food source. So that makes the most sense out of the options that are provided. So because the mealybug is at stake now. The ladybird has no other food source, so obviously it would not survive. So C would make the most sense. And we can also rule out D, caterpillar population increasing. That would not happen. Okay, so... Although when you look at it, you can see that the caterpillar may have the possibility of increasing in the population because now without the competition from the mealybug because the mealybug also depended on hibiscus leaves as a food source so the caterpillar now has one less competitor so it would have more hibiscus leaves available to the caterpillars so there could be a possibility that 
this can be an advantage for the caterpillars and lead to the increasing population. But out of all the options, C makes the most sense. For sure, the ladybird population will die out. All right, let's go on to the next question. Item 4 refers to the following diagram, which shows a process that occurs in the human body. So we have low concentration. So the pluses are probably more than likely representing molecules within the body. And we have a line. So that would represent some kind of membrane. And then we're seeing high concentration. So the pluses here. So you're going from a low concentration to a high concentration across this membrane. So the process illustrated in the diagram above is referred to as this would have to be no other than active transport. So active transport is the movement of molecules from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration. So it's going against the concentration gradient. So that's not natural. So this process would require energy from ATP to get it going. So active transport for sure. Item 5 refers to the following diagram, which shows a final step involved in the testing for the presence of starch in a leaf. So when solution X is dropped on the leaf, assuming photosynthesis has occurred, the leaf will become. So we should know this test for starch in a leaf, how you test the leaf for starch. So we're using iodine as the reagent, so that's the solution X. So iodine generally would be a lightish brownish color, brownish, yellowish color. So when that is dropped on the leaf, if starch is present, you would expect the color change to be blue-black. So it's going to go from that brownish color of the iodine to a blue-black color. So the options provided here, but they just have black, so B would have to be the correct answer. But typically the black has a, a tinge of blue, of blue in it, so they normally would describe it as blue-black. All right, so question six, which of the following minerals plays an important role in the nucleus of the cell and is necessary for the formation of bones and teeth? So they're giving you two roles of this particular mineral. So it's important in the nucleus and it is needed for forming bones and teeth. So the two obvious options there would be calcium or phosphorus. But when you look at the role in the nucleus, that would help you to rule out one over the other. So the answer for this one should be phosphorus because phosphorus is a mineral that is needed to form the genetic material DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. So DNA actually consists of, of phosphorus so that definitely would rule out calcium being the option, although we know that calcium is necessary for the formation of bones and teeth. But out of, the, um, out of um, those two minerals, phosphorus would make the most sense because phosphorus is a component of DNA which is found in the nucleus. Okay, question six. Which of the following vitamins is classified as water-soluble? So that would be C vitamin C. So there are two water-soluble vitamins, vitamin B and C. So these, these vitamins, they dissolve in the water and basically they have to be replenished on a daily basis. So when we urinate, when we sweat, you know, these vitamins can easily leave the body. So they're not stored in the body like fat-soluble vitamins, which would be the vitamin A, the D, and the vitamin K. So you have to constantly replenish these vitamins because they're easily lost from the body. All right, let's go on to the next set of questions. Question A, the best reason for including water in the diet is that, so water is necessary for dissolving nutrients during digestion. So out of all those options there, that one makes the most sense. You need water to help with the breakdown and the absorption of nutrients during digestion. 
Question 9. Which of the following measures can be used to categorize obesity? So we have height, weight, blood pressure, body mass index. So the correct answer for this will be the body mass index. So you cannot just say height alone. You can't say weight alone. It is actually the combination of the two. So it's like that ratio of height and weight. So the body mass index is that statistical measure that um, allows us to determine if an individual is of healthy weight or overweight, obese. So it really is determined by the weight over the height squared, the individual's weight divided by their height squared. So that is the body mass index, commonly known as a BMI. So D would be the correct answer. Question 10, which of the following teeth pre present in children and adults is responsible for grinding food into smaller pieces? Now, let me highlight that part there because you may easily glance over it. They mention present in both children and adults. So off the bat, you may say, without reading that part, you might think, okay, grinding food, it has to be molars. But molars are not present in both children and adults. Molars are only present in adults. So the correct answer for this would have to be the premolars. So these are like the mini molars in a sense. So children would have premolars, same thing as adults, but children do not have molars. So that's what differentiates between the molars and the premolars. So if they had acts in only adults, well then you can say molars. But the premolars will be responsible for grinding food in both children and adults. Question 11. Which row in the following table correctly matches the enzyme with its site of production? Alright, so we have enzyme and the site of production. So let's go through this. Sucrase is not produced by pancre the pancreas. So the sucrase is actually produced by the intestinal walls. So that is an enzyme that comes from the intestinal wall. So we can rule out that. Maltase, that is not produced by the salivary glands. Maltase is also going to be secreted by the walls of the small intestine. Pepsin is secreted by the walls of the stomach. We know that this enzyme is present in the stomach and is responsible for breaking down, speeding up the breakdown of protein. So that one definitely would be correct. And we can also rule out the last one, amylase. We know that amylase can be produced by either the pancreas or the salivary glands, not the walls of the small intestine. So C is the correct answer. Okay, item 12 refers to the following graph, which shows how the rate of reaction varies with temperature for a certain enzyme. So we're seeing here the on the y-axis, we have the rate of reaction. And on the x-axis, we have temperature in degrees Celsius. So clearly, we're seeing a curve. You have an increase as the rate of reaction is increasing. And then it gets a little higher. The rate of reaction increases as the temperature is getting higher till it reaches a point. And then beyond that temperature, we're seeing a decrease in the rate of reaction. So it says here, which of the following conclusions can be deduced from the graph above? So let's look at the options. So the rate of reaction reaches a maximum at 20 degrees Celsius. That is definitely not. The rate of reaction reaches a maximum at 40. So this is where the maximum rate would be. At 40, so you read off from there and come down. So we can rule out option A. Option B says the optimum temperature for the reaction is 30 degrees Celsius. Once again, that is incorrect. We just saw that the optimum temperature would be 40 degrees Celsius because that is when the rate of reaction is the highest. So option B is a no no as well. Option C, the rate of reaction is slower at lower temperatures. So if we look at it, we can agree with option C because at lower temperatures, so 0 degrees Celsius to 10 and 20 and 30, the rate of reaction is, is quite low. So you're seeing a general increase as the temperature is increasing. 
So therefore, C should be the correct answer. We can also rule out the rate of reaction decreases as the temperature increases. The only time that would happen is after a certain point, which would be after 40 degrees Celsius when you're seeing the rate of reaction decreasing. So the correct answer should definitely be C. So the rate of reaction is slower at lower temperatures. So you need some kind of energy, some kind of heat energy to get the reactant molecules, the enzymes and the substrate that the enzymes will be working on. They need to be able to collide and get the reaction going. So they need some level of energy. So that's why at lower temperatures, the rate of reaction is, is very slow. So as the temperature increases, you're seeing the rate of reaction increasing as well. All right, let's go to the next page. So item 13 refers to the following diagram, which shows the organs of the digestive system. Which of the labeled organs above is the pancreas? So one is pointing at the stomach. Two would be the actual answer, which is the pancreas. Three is pointing at the gallbladder. And four is pointing at the appendix of the large intestine. So the answer for this would be B. So that is the pancreas. It looks like a leaf, a leaf-shaped structure. Question 14. A villus is best able to perform its function because it has. So a villus is that finger-like projection that you would find. You find many of these lying in the small intestines. So you, these would be the several projections that you find on the villus, which is in microvilli. So these are like tiny little villi on the, the epithelial cells that actually the, the villus is made up of. So D would definitely be the answer. So you can rule out the others. The thick epithelial lining makes no sense. The epithelial lining is actually very thin. And it has a large surface area, so we can rule out option B. Few carrier proteins within its cell membrane, that doesn't make sense. But that part is related to the active transport of materials across the intestines. They depend on carrier proteins. So you would expect a lot of carrier proteins for active transport of certain nutrients across the villi. So D definitely will be the best um, feature of the villus that is responsible for its function. Okay, let's look at question 15. In which of the following organs does chemical digestion occur only? So you should know there's a difference between chemical digestion and mechanical digestion. So we need to find the organ where only chemical digestion would occur. So the mouth actually has both mechanical and chemical occurring, so we rule that out. The stomach, similarly, would have both mechanical and chemical digestion. The small intestine, so the small intestine is only going to carry out chemical digestion. So that is actually the breakdown of large nutrients into smaller nutrients. So that is what's going to occur in the small intestine. You do not have um, mechanical digestion occurring. And we can rule out the large intestine because... Technically, neither one would occur in the large intestine. You just have the absorption of the water into the blood and the formation of stool. So C would be the correct answer for 15. All right, let's look at question 16. So which of the following factors may not affect the breathing rate of an individual? So we know that breathing rate can be affected by various factors. So which one of these would not affect the breathing rate? So that would have to be the height of the individual. All the others would affect the breathing rate in some form. So the drugs that a person might be taking, the person's weight. So the heavier you are, sometimes the more difficult your, often the more difficult your breathing would become. And then the higher altitudes, so the higher you go, if you were to go and climb a mountain, your breathing is going to get um, faster. It's going to get a little more difficult because there's less oxygen available in the air as you go higher. So B for sure would be the answer. The height is not going to affect the individual's breathing rate. 
Item 17 to 18 refer to the following graph which shows the relationship between the average age of a death of death and the number of cigarettes smoked per day. So we see average age of death in years on the y-axis and then cigarette smoked per day on the x-axis. So if an individual died at 70 years old, how many cigarettes did he or she smoke per day? So what you do, you go to the graph, you look for the age 70. So an individual who is 70, we're trying to figure out how many cigarettes they would be smoking a day. So you just come across and you reach the point on the graph and then you come down to see how much cigarettes have been smoked. So the answer for that would be five. So therefore B is the correct one. Number 18, at what average age did non-smokers die? So we're looking for the age of non-smokers dying. So therefore, obviously to find out about the non-smokers, you would have to look at the cigarette smoke per day. So we're looking at zero cigarette smoke per day. So persons who don't smoke at all. So then you come up along the, the axis, the y-axis, and you go to that age. So right here, that point there where zero cigarettes are smoked per day. So those are the non-smokers. So they have an average age of death between 74 and 75. So say 74.5 years, right? So then our answer would definitely be C. All right, let's go to the next question, question 19. So item 19 refers to the following diagram, which shows the structures of the human respiratory system. In which of the labeled structures above does gaseous exchange take place? So you should know that gaseous exchange occurs in the alveoli. So if you look at the structures shown here, you should be able to recognize them. So one is pointing at the trachea, two. So two is actually pointing at the alveoli, so those little ear sacs. So we got our answer there. That's where gaseous exchange takes place. Three looks like it's pointing at the, the bronchioles. And then four is labeling the diaphragm. So our answer for 19 would be B. So that is where the alveoli are. Number 20, which chamber of the heart has the thickest wall? So that would be the left ventricle. And the reason for this is that the left ventricle needs to be able to withstand the high pressure of blood coming through the heart from the left side because that blood needs to be pumped up through the aorta and all around the body. So it's going to be under very, very high pressure. So that is why the left ventricle is going to have very, very thick walls. So it can withstand that, that pressure of blood. Question 21. Systolic pressure is defined as the... So the systolic pressure would be the highest pressure in the heart when it is contracting. So when the heart contracts, so when the heart muscle is contracting that is when the pressure is going to be the highest. So that would be D. The opposite now would be diastolic pressure. So that is when the pressure would be lower as the heart is relaxing. So D. Okay, question 22. Lymph is different from tissue fluid because lymph contains a higher concentration of so the answer for this one, so this one I can see being a tricky one. So remember that blood leaks out into, so the plasma from blood leaks out into the, the, the cells to form tissue fluid. So it leaks from the capillaries into the cells to form tissue fluid. So you go from plasma to forming tissue fluid. And then the tissue fluid that surrounds the cells, usually they would supply the cells with all the regular the nutrients that are necessary. So then when the tissue fluid pretty much offloads its um, nutrients 
and then collects any waste, say carbon dioxide and urea and that kind of thing, then it turns into lymph. So lymph now would be the colorless fluid that is going to drain into the lymph vessels and then be taken back into the circulatory system pretty much to be recycled after being filtered by the lymph nodes, getting cleaned up of any pathogens or anything that shouldn't be there, getting rid of excess um, fluids. So that is what the lymph is. So literally it is drained tissue fluid. So in terms of the concentration, you would expect that, well in my opinion, the concentration of the carbon dioxide and urea, you would think that that would be a little higher than the tissue fluid. So the tissue fluid, yes, it would bring all the nutrients and so forth into the, the surrounding tissues, uh, flows the nutrients, and then you have any waste material, but the thing is the carbon dioxide and the urea, that usually is going to return to the blood. So that doesn't get into the lymph. So you don't want to make that mistake. So that carbon dioxide and the urea, remember it is waste materials. So they're going to go back into the blood and then eventually needs to be excreted since they're both waste substances. So for this one, the concentration, I believe the higher concent there should be a higher concentration of amino acids and water. So you're going to have more fluid because the lymph collects any excess fluid. So that is what makes me lean more towards um, option B. So you're having more water because of the excess fluid that is being drained from the tissue fluid surrounding the, the cells of the tissue. So I'm going to have to settle with B, amino acids and water being of higher concentration in the lymph compared to the tissue fluid. All right, let's look at item 23. So item 23 refers to the following diagrams which show four components of the blood. So components Q, R, S, and T. So which row in the following table correctly identifies each component of blood above? So Q looks like it should be the phagocytes. R, as you can see, you're looking at certain observable characteristics. So Q, we can see that the nucleus looks a little irregularly shaped. So that for sure would be the phagocyte, which feeds off of the, which engulfs pathogens. R would be the lymphocytes. So the lymphocytes tend to have a more regular rounded shape and their nucleus tend to be more regular and fill up a lot of the space within the cell. S would have to be the platelets, which are pretty much fragments of cells, so they're very tiny. And then T looks like the red blood cells. So based on that, that the correct answer therefore should be A. So Q phagocytes, R lymphocytes, S platelets, and T red blood cells. All right. Right. <laughs> so the question 24, the role of an artificial pacemaker is to so an artificial pacemaker is obviously placed into the, the heart of an individual to control their heartbeat, to basically regulate it. So A, 25, tendons are tissues which, so tendons are the bands of tissue that, the connected tissue that connects muscles to bone. So they attach the ends of muscles to bone to facilitate movement at a joint. Ligaments, on the other hand, would do something different. They would connect bone to bone and prevent dislocation of the bone. So it's more about stabilizing the joint and making sure bones don't separate and dislocate. Tendons are all about facilitating movement at the joint. 
So obviously it's going to connect the muscles to the bones to allow that movement to occur. Okay, 26, which row in the following table describes the action of the antagonistic muscles when flexing the lower arm? So remember that word antagonistic means opposite. So the muscles are going to be behaving opposite to each other. So when one muscle is doing one thing, the other muscle is doing the opposite. So when the arm is flexing, you would expect that the biceps would be contracting. So it's going to start to bulge. It looks bulgy. And then the triceps will do the opposite and relax. So therefore, C would be the correct answer. So biceps contracts, triceps relaxes. 27, at which type of joint are bones separated by cartilage pads and allowed slight movement? So looking at these options here, a fixed joint is one that does not have any movement whatsoever. So it literally, as the term fits would imply, there's no movement between the joints. So the cranium would be an example of that. Also, the pelvis, so there's no movement between the joints. The hinge joint, we have that movement at the elbow and the knees, so there is movement in one plane only. Synovial joints represent joints that obviously have synovial fluid, and synovial fluid would be found at joints that allow full movement. Similarly, the last one, ball and socket, the ball and socket joint would allow full rotational movement. So we're talking about the shoulder joint and the, the joint at the hips. So honestly, this is probably a mistake from CSC, but I personally would not put any of these as options because B, C, and D, they're going to allow full movement for sure. And the fit joint usually allows no movement. But according to the marking scheme, they say <laughs> fixed, the fixed joint. So what they're saying is that there's slight movement at the fixed joint. As far as I know, usually there is no movement at all. But that is the only one there that would probably make sense because the others you can definitely rule out. So I'll put a little question mark by that one because I'm not sure if that's an error. Because typically fixed joints, they don't even allow much of any movement. There are other joints within the body, within the skeleton, that does allow slight movement. So you may have like a little gliding movement, a little pivot or whatever. Um, so like the wrist joints, you know, there's slight movement between them, but the fish joint, in my opinion, I don't think that that would be right, but that is the answer given by CSC. All right, let's move on to the next question. Item 28 refers to the following diagram of a skeleton. The bone label Z is the, so Z is pointing at the tibia, aka the shin bone. So the fibula would be the smaller bone there to the side towards the back, sort of. So yeah, so B, B is the correct answer, the tibia. Items 29 to 30 refer to the following diagram, which shows the internal structure of the skin. In answering items 29 to 30, each option may be used once, more than once, or not at all. So for 29, which of the structures above secretes sweat? So that would have to be the sweat gland. And you can identify the sweat gland here in the diagram. That would be A. So A is the sweat gland. All right, so A is the sweat gland. And then for 30, which of the structures above is stimulated when a person feels cold? Okay, so we know that there are lots of changes that can occur in the skin when the temperature goes down. But based on what they have here labeled, so let's see what the other labels could possibly be. B looks like it is a blood vessel. Um, D would be the hair erector muscle. And C looks like a, a nerve ending or receptor. So 
what would be stimulated during cold weather would be the hair erector muscle. So if you understand, the hair erector muscle is going to contract and cause the hair to pull up and stand erect on the skin. So that is supposed to encourage warm air to be trapped on the skin surface to help conserve heat and warm up the body. So therefore, D probably makes the most sense. That is the one that will be stimulated, stimulated to contract to keep the person warm. All right, let's go to question 31. Okay, so item 31 refers to the following graph which shows the level of glucose in the blood of an individual at various times throughout the day. So, which of the following activities is most likely during occurring during phase 3? So, we're looking at this phase here. So, first of all, obviously, you need to understand what the graph is showing you. So, we're seeing that in phase 3, the, glu the blood glucose levels have increased pretty much to the highest throughout the day, the person's day. And then you notice that there is a decrease. So we have an increase up to the highest amount of glucose in the blood. So let's see which one will most likely be occurring during phase three. So we can rule out sleeping. So you're not going to have those changes in blood glucose <laughs> during sleep. Fasting between meals. Um, I think we can also rule that out too. Because we're seeing an increase first and then a decrease. Vigorous exercise was just completed. So if that was the case, you should have like a, a rapid decrease. Because you're going to be using up the glucose store, the glucose during exercise. Because glucose is needed for energy. So you would imagine that the glucose levels would rapidly drop. So you shouldn't expect that increase so the only thing that would make sense would be D. You have a meal rich in carbohydrates that was just consumed. So as soon as you finish eating, you have that increase. And then obviously later on, it starts to decrease over time. So D makes the most sense in there. Okay, 32. Which of the following activities would cause the body to release antidiuretic hormone? So, you, first of all, you need to understand what antidiuretic hormone does, what its role in the body is. So, this is only released in times when the body is pretty much dehydrated. There is not sufficient water in the fluids of the body. So, it is released as a way to conserve the little amounts of water present in the body. So, it's trying to prevent too much water from being um, lost in the urine particularly. So... Out of these options, B would make the most sense. So when someone is excessively sweating, they're losing a lot of water. So the body now has to try to retain the little bit of water that is present. So that is why the antidiuretic hormone will be released from the pituitary gland. So B would be the correct answer. Question 33, which of the following types of reflexes is pupil dilation? So reflex actions, remember these are involuntary actions. So we have no control over them whatsoever. And there are two different types of reflex actions in the body you should be aware of. So you have the cranial reflexes and the spinal reflexes. So the pupil dilation, so that the pupil is part of the eye. So the cranial reflex would have to be the correct answer. So cranial reflexes involve the messages going to the brain, while the spinal reflexes would involve messages going to the spinal cord. So the pupil senses in the eye and is part of the head region. The nervous impulses would go to the brain, so hence it would be a cranial reflex. Unlike if it was a knee-jerk response, no, a knee-jerk reflex, that would be 
a spinal reflex because the messages are, are being transmitted to the spinal cord. So B is the correct answer. All right, let's go on to question 34. Which of the following describes the functions of sense organs? So we have some options here. Warn of danger, detection of stimuli, inform about the environment. Okay, so out of these options, so two and three for sure. I can see some people might include one, warning of danger, but technically the sense organs don't warn of the danger. It helps you to see what's happening or to be aware of what's happening, but technically speaking, it's not going to warn you of the danger. So I would have to go with two and three only. So that would be C. So we know our sense organs allow for detection of stimuli, so any change in the environment, therefore informing us about what is happening in the environment. Question 35, Linda is looking at a coconut tree. If she has normal vision, how will the image of the tree appear on her retina? So remember the retina is where you have the cone cells and the rod cells. So this, this consists of, these are the photoreceptors. So when the light rays fall on the retina, the information would then be transmitted to the brain. So we have the retina receiving the light and then the information has to be interpreted and sent to the brain from there. So the image on the retina usually would be upside down before it is interpreted by the brain, which will put it right side up. So that we can rule out A, that's on the side, B is on the side, C is the right side up. So D would have to be the correct answer because the tree is upside down. Okay, 36. Brent has low blood sugar levels. Which of the following hormones is being secreted to ensure that he has sufficient energy to continue his activities? So at low blood sugar levels, the hormone glucagon would be produced. So this is the hormone that works opposite to insulin. Insulin is produced when the levels of glucose are too high in the body. So then the insulin helps to trigger the reaction the mechanism to help lower the blood sugar levels. So whether it's converting that gl glucose to glycogen in the liver or enhancing the uptake of glucose into these cells, that's how the insulin works. But the glucagon works opposite to insulin. So therefore, because Brent's level of, of glucose is low, his blood sugar levels are low, the glucagon will be secreted by the pancreas to help stimulate more glucose to be produced. So you get a breakdown of glycogen from the liver. So B is the correct answer for that. 37, Michael has diabetes mellitus. Which of the following vision disorders is he at risk of developing? So we see a whole bunch of vision disorders here. And the one that he would be most at risk of developing would be the cataract. Because diabetics tend to suffer from cataracts more. Um, it has to do with damage to like blood vessels and damage to the lens. Because cataract affects the lens. It makes the lens opaque. So diabetics tend to have issues with damaged lens, so therefore they have that vision problem. The light rays can't pass through the lens properly as it should be. So that is one of the main vision disorders that diabetics tend to, tend to develop. Okay, next page 38. Which of the following comparisons about sexual and asexual reproduction is true? So out of these comparisons, we know that sexual reproduction involves two parents, so we can rule out one. Sexual reproduction produces offspring that are not genetically identical, so that has it mixed up. C involves the fusion of gametes, does not involve the fusion of gametes, so this one for sure, C. So all the others are switched around. 
So with asexual, you will have one parent, genetically identical offspring, and large number of offspring being produced. So C is correct. Item 39 refers to the following graph, which shows the level of estrogen produced during the menstrual cycle. So we see in the level of estrogen on the y-axis and then the time in days on the x-axis. So it says which of the following processes is most likely occurring at point x. So if you look at it, point x, you have the level of estrogen being the highest and that occurs around day 14. So your knowledge of the menstrual cycle should allow you to understand that it could only be one process happening here and that would be ovulation. So when the egg is being released from the ovary. So you usually have that increase of estrogen um, around ovulation. Question 40. Which of the following structures is expelled from the vagina shortly after childbirth? So that would be A, the placenta, which is obviously commonly known as the afterbirth. So after the baby comes out, shortly after we have the placenta, which is the baby's life support during pregnancy. So that comes out following birth. 41, which of the following methods of birth control prevents ovulation and implantation? So we have barrier, natural, surgical, and hormonal. So this would have to be hormonal D because we know that the pill, the birth control pill, goes under that category. So hormones are used to stop ovulation from occurring. And also as it relates to the IUD, that would stop implantation. So some IUDs produce hormones, some of them don't. But the combination of the ovulation and implantation being prevented, it definitely would be hormonal methods. 42, Georgia does not complete her course of antibiotics because she is feeling better. Which of the following outcomes is likely to occur as a result of her not finishing her course of antibiotics? So it is always advised to take the full course of antibiotics. So even if you are feeling better. If the doctor prescribes the medication, the antibiotics to be taken for X period of time, you make sure you take them for that X period of time, even if you start to feel better. The reason for this is that it's supposed to help get rid of resistant bacteria. The susceptible bacteria, those are gonna kill off easy because the antibiotics would affect them quickly, but there is a chance of resistant bacteria. So these are the ones that put up a fight and they they are stronger and they counteract the antibiotics a little more than the other ones that will be killed off easy. So the longer period of using the antibiotics would more likely ensure that these resistant types of bacteria would actually be destroyed so that they don't remain in the body and start growing and multiplying. So therefore, C would be the correct answer. So we want to make sure that the resistant bacteria in our body do not stay there and are not left to grow and multiply. Okay, let's look at 43. So item 43 refers to the following punnett square for flower color, where capital R equals red and common R equals white. So we're seeing here that female set cells, so this is a female flower. So these represent the female gametes. So we have capital R and common R, the male flower here providing the male gametes, the sperm. We have similarly the capital R and the common R. So when the cross is carried out, we're seeing the flowers produce. So pretty much, if we're going to talk about the phenotype, which is the observable characteristic that was described there, so either red or white. So we're seeing three red flowers. So as long as the dominant allele, which is capital R, is present, the flower would become red. So all three of these are red flowers. So this last one here is the white flower. So that's the phenotype. 
Now the question asks about the genotypic ratio. So what is the genotypic ratio of red flowers to white flowers? So a key word there is genotypic. So remember genotypes are the actual alleles, the genetic makeup of the individual. So we have to be looking exactly at these letters here. So we have one homozygous dominant genotype and then we have two heterozygous genotype and then the last one would be homozygous recessive. So therefore the genotypic ratio would have to be one to two to one. So that would be C. If they had asked about the phenotypic ratio, well then it will be three to one because there are three red flowers to one white flower. But since they specified genotypic ratio, we have one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and then one homozygous recessive. So that is your answer there. Item 44 refers to the following diagram which shows a cell undergoing the process of mitosis. Which of the following phases of mitosis is occurring in the cell above? So we can see here that the chromosomes, they have split apart from each other and they are moving to opposite ends of the cell. So these are the chromosomes that are split here and now they're moving to opposite ends of the cell. So therefore, the answer for that would be anaphase, when the chromosomes move away to opposite poles of the cell. All right, question 45. Alternative genes for eye color are referred to as? So alternative genes, so that means different forms of the same gene. So that would be alleles. So that's what alternative genes are. So you may have an allele for brown eyes versus an allele for blue eyes, etc. 46. The human papilloma virus HPV vaccine for young women may help prevent. So the HPV vaccine is meant to prevent against cervical cancer. So out of those can these cancers listed is cervical cancer that it is supposed to prevent. 47. Organisms that transmit disease-causing microbes to other organisms are called, so these will be the vectors, so they actually carry and transmit pathogens to other organisms, so like houseflies, mosquitoes, rats, etc. 48. Glucose is found in the urine of diabetics because... All right, so let's see what options we have here. Stored fats in the body are being oxidized. No, that makes no sense. Too much glucose is absorbed by the kidney cells. Okay, so I can see that one making sense. So think of it. A diabetic has too much glucose present in the blood. And we know normally the kidney is responsible for excreting any waste substances so urea any excess water minerals so a diabetic because it has so much glucose in the blood often the glucose that normally would be reabsorbed at a particular stage in the kidneys nephron instead of being reabsorbed back into the blood so that you end up with no glucose in the urine you have that glucose some of the glucose being retained by the kidney so I can see B as making sense. So instead of all the glucose going back into the blood, the kidney retains um, some of that glucose. Um, C says not enough glucose in the blood is converted to, to glycogen. Okay, so that cannot, that's also an option there. So not enough glucose in the blood converted to glycogen. So normally with diabetics, they have a problem with utilizing the glucose. So the glucose starts to build up in the blood because of either insulin resistance. So if the insulin isn't working, 
it doesn't stimulate the cells to take in the glucose and it doesn't stimulate the, the glucose to be converted into glycogen by the liver. So, so C looks like it should be the correct answer. Um, let's see, D, there's an increased uptake and use of glucose by the body cells. No, so that's definitely ruled out in the last one. So we can go with C. Although, as I said, the one of the key reasons why there's glucose in the urine is because the kidney is excreting the excess amount of glucose in the body. So because there's so much in the blood, some of it, a lot of it is retained in the nephron of the kidney, so it ends up in the urine. So, but I guess um, C would probably be the better answer here. Okay, um, 49. Bacteria were grown on agar plate until the plate was covered with visible bacterial colonies. Four discs containing equal amounts of different antibiotics were then placed on the agar plate. After two days, clear areas had formed around some of the discs, as shown in the diagram below. So we have a petri dish, an agar plate here, showing you bacterial colonies. So basically, we have a lawn of bacteria and some antibiotic discs that were placed. So the white areas represent the clear regions. So which of the following conclusions about the experiment is correct? Okay, let's go through this. Antibiotic Z is the most effective of the four antibiotics. Well, that makes no sense because as you can see, antibiotic Z has not even produced any clearing. So remember the white clear area represents the antibiotic being effective. So the fact that you have a clearing in the bacterial lawn, the bacterial colonies, is indicating that the antibiotic is effective. So therefore, with Z, this antibiotic isn't doing a thing. It is not effective at all at getting rid of the bacteria. So it does not kill the bacteria. So we can rule out A. B says antibiotic W is more effective against these bacteria than antibiotic X. So, yeah, so that makes sense. So we're seeing a larger clearing for the antibiotic this W compared to X. So that looks like it should be the correct answer. But let's just look at what the other options are just to be sure. Antibiotic Y is more effective against these bacteria than antibiotic X. So antibiotic Y and X are pretty much doing the same thing. The clearing looks practically the same size, so they're probably of equal um, equal effectiveness there. And uh, the last one, antibiotic Y is more effective against these bacteria than antibiotic W. So that that obviously would be wrong. So yes, yeah, so we can uh, we can conclude that B would be the correct answer. So we're seeing here that W is more effective at getting rid of the bacteria than X because we have a larger clearing. All right, let's go to the next page. Okay, question 15. Infectious diseases such as colds and influenza are most commonly spread by... So for sure, this would be inhaling airborne pathogens. So all these diseases are common airborne diseases caused by viruses. So these are caused by inhaling the airborne pathogens. So when someone sneezes on you or coughs or even talks, the saliva particles coming out at you, all of that would be airborne um, droplets, where the pathogens would be found in. Question 51, which of the following factors contributes most to the development of obesity? So far, sure, that would be lifestyle. So all the lifestyle habits, such as eating too much, not exercising, those are the key, the key habits. So not only eating too much, but eating too much of the wrong things. So a lot of fats, particularly. Question 52, the correct sequence of the stages in the life cycle of a mosquito is... So A should be the correct answer. We start off with the egg, and then the larva, then the pupa, and then 
the final stage, the adult. 53, Mala is vaccinated against the disease and her antibody concentration increases rapidly. However, over the next few days, there is a gradual decrease in her antibody concentration. What type of immunity does Mala experience? So key words there, she was vaccinated. So she's vaccinated against the disease. So a vaccine implies that she got the actual pathogen. So whether it was dead or weakened, that was inserted into her blood to create, to help her to produce antibodies against the pathogen. So this would have to be an example of active artificial immunity or artificial actively acquired immunity. So that is B. Question 54. What is the correct order of the processes involved in large-scale water purification? So in large-scale water purification, the first step is usually the screening process. So you're trying to get rid of any large um, substances, debris like sticks and rocks and paper, anything that you will find in the water. So screening is usually first, then we have the sedimentation step. So when the, the um, solids start to settle out, then you have the filtration step. So you're filtering off um, those solids, particles, and so forth. And then the last step will be chlorination, the disinfection step. So C would be the correct answer. 55, what is the role of bacteria in sewage treatment? So bacteria, we know, is a decomposer. So it feeds off of the organic matter within the sewage. So it helps to break down that organic matter. So that would be C. 56, a student used the apparatus below to test water for bacteria. Which row in the following table shows the correct labels for X, Y, and Z? Okay, so X is the spatula that we're going to use to actually swab, sorry. <laughs> X is the swab that you use to wipe. So you're going to use the water there to just the swab to swab the water along the, the um, surface of the agar. Y would have to be, so that's the Petri dish. And then Z would be the agar gel. So that's what we're swiping the, the uh, water on. So the correct answer would have to be B. So the others don't make sense. You don't, it's not a spatula. It's not a watch glass they're being used. And it certainly is not petroleum jelly. So B is the correct answer for that. All right, so final set of questions. So 57, Aaron lives down river from a farm. One year, he notices that algae are covering the surface of the river and fish are washing up dead on the shore. The most likely reason the fish died is due to... So this looks like a consequence of eutrophication. So we have an overgrowth of algae usually from a uh, release of detergents, um, so nitrates and phosphates, fertilizers that get into the water. So that leads to the overgrowth of the algae. So as the algae covers the surface of the water, it, it kind of causes a whole domino effect of bad things happening in the ecosystem. So all the organisms in the river would eventually be affected neg negatively because, first of all, plants, they're not going to be getting sunlight. You have a lot of plants dying. And then as they're dying, you have less oxygen being released, more carbon dioxide building up. So less oxygen, oxygen leads to the death of the fish. So therefore, the reason the fish died would definitely be because of the lack of oxygen. So it's not particularly that the pesticides or the fertilizers from the farm directly affects the fish, although that could be a possibility. But the fact that they mentioned the algae covering the surface of the river, we know that eutrophication would have occurred. So that usually leads to the death of organisms because of a lack of oxygen. 
So yeah, so A. Item 58 refers to the following table which shows the types of garbage generated on a weekly basis in the households of persons in a rural village. So we have the different types of garbage outlined there, peels, garden trimmings, tins and glass bottles, plastic and paper waste. And they're showing the number of bags produced in a week. So what would be the best method of domestic refuse disposal for the villagers to utilize to help reduce the amount of garbage sent to the landfill? So we can see that the, the greatest number of bags of waste produced comes from tins and glass bottles. And then we have plastics. So all of these are actually what you would call um, non-biodegradable waste. So these can actually be recycled, so basically reprocessed. So what would be the best method would definitely be recycling. You don't want to be burning, <laughs> burning the waste. That's not good. That's combustion, causing a lot of smoke to go into the atmosphere. Um, biodiesel, that usually would be the breakdown of organic waste materials, so the decomposable matter, biodegradable matter, to produce um, biodiesel, which is a fuel. But the recycling seems to be the better bet since um, there's more, the most bags produced in the week from these type of waste. So these are recyclable waste, the bottles and the tins and plastic. Composting would more relate to the peelings and the garden trimmings. You can use those to um, farm compost, which can help fertilize plants. But yes, yeah, so C would be the best method for domestic refuse disposal based on the number of bags and the type of garbage being produced. 59. Sarav burns his household garbage every weekend. Not very good, Sarav. Which of the following is an effect of the smoke? So the first thing that should come to mind would definitely be global warming. So he's burning stuff every weekend. So lots of smoke and lots of gases are going to be produced. So carbon dioxide is a key gas that is released that can cause a greenhouse effect and lead to global warming. So C. And the final question, 60, which of the following components is common to both the biological filter method and activated sludge method? So we're talking here about the whole process of sewage treatment, how sewage is treated to get rid of the organic matter and then make clean water. So the stage that would be common to but the component common to both of these methods would have to be a the grit pit so this is usually where the solid waste the sewage would actually be settling and starting to coagulate and stuff like that in the grit pit the other the others would not be common to both so like the aeration tank that would be only present in the activated sludge method and then the last two, the percolating filter and the stones covering, covered with aerobic bacteria, that would be components of the biological filter method. All right, so that brings us to the end of this specimen paper one.